Are negotiations important to commons? I'd say that they are important in virtually all commons. In fact, there is a special word for negotiating in the commons. It's called commoning, the verb. Commoning is the social practice of working things out with your fellow commoners to manage things in a fair, effective, sustainable way. If in a market everyone is trucking and bartering, as Adam Smith famously put it, in a commons everyone's trying to figure out a solution that will bring individual uh, concerns into alignment with group interests. That requires negotiation and time and energy and conflict and disagreement and patience and trust. It requires ongoing dialogue to reassess how well the negotiated rules and social practices are working over time. Now obviously the nature of negotiations will vary dramatically depending upon the particular commons and the resource that's being managed. We'll get to this in the next video, but for now, let's just note that there are countless types of commons and that no two are exactly alike. That's because every commons is the product of its own peculiar history, culture, geography, social values, and so forth. So in a commons of software code, for example, often open source software, a community of hackers insist upon openness in contributing and testing code. The more talented coders are given greater authority in deciding which code is used and which code is rejected. Everyone in the commons respects the ultimate goal of running code that does what it's supposed to do without bugs. In Wikipedia and other commons, there's an elaborate global governance structure that has evolved to manage more than 90,000 volunteer editors and contributors, all of them working on versions of Wikipedia in several dozen languages. There are often intense philosophical disagreements there between, for example, the inclusivists who want to include information on pop culture and trivia and those who want Wikipedia to be more selective in what they post online. In a water commons, there's a high priority on maintaining stable flows of water and fair access to it. But the negotiations will have a lot to do with the circumstances of a given ecosystem. For example, the rules in an Asequia commons in New Mexico, a very dry region, will be quite different from those in a tropical lush region, say Brazil. A household is a kind of commons, and there everyone needs to negotiate rules that take care of the basic household needs, the chores, the food preparation, who's going to take out the garbage, and so forth. And then there are countless other types of commons to think about urban spaces, alternative currencies, local food systems, the ethno-botanical knowledge of indigenous peoples, open access scholarly journals, the open design and manufacturing uh, collective process that's producing the wiki speed car. There's just countless commons. All of these require negotiations among the commoners to come up with a governance system and rules that makes sense for that particular group of people and that particular resource in that particular context. Now notice this key difference. Unlike in a market where everything is transactional, a one-time cash exchange for goods or services with no personal connections among the players, in a commons everything is relational. All negotiations take place in a larger context of the community's interests and those interests persist over time. The negotiations typically take account of the individual's needs in relation to the group, and they take account of the future of the community and the future of its resource, sometimes future generations. While we're familiar with, uh, with negotiations in the market to get the best price or the best contract terms, negotiations in a commons are more about stewardship of a community and its resources than about ownership or investment interests. It's not just about money, in other words. It's about a whole host of qualitative, personal, social, and ecological interests. Here's another difference. Negotiations in a market setting often seek to displace costs onto other parties or onto nature or onto future generations. But commoners tend to realize that that's really a delusion. There's no way to externalize costs, as economists put it, without hurting people or hurting nature. Those costs need to be internalized into the whole system of resource management. In a commons, 
people are more aware that everything and everyone is connected to each other. And that's why commoners generally try to in, uh, internalize any environmental or social costs. They know that they will likely have to live with, it, with whatever costs or harms they create, unlike absentee investors, for example, who simply move on to the next unspoiled territory. Let me just add that commons are not just one big committee meeting or negotiation. There can be many types of governance structures. And governance structures in a commons matter. But the best ones tend not to be representational, but participatory. Commoners need to have a direct say in making the rules, if only because they need to feel that those rules are fair and that they will work hard, and so they'll work hard to enforce the rules and monitor them so that free riders and vandals don't destroy the commons. A successful commons also needs to have transparency so that everyone can see how the rules are made and what those rules are. The rules don't need to be formal and written. Oftentimes, they're informal and simply a part of the culture and the social norms of that commons. As all of this suggests, a commons is not so much a large uh, a legal contract as a social covenant. A commons amounts to a set of committed relationships to shared goals or a set of ideals and a determination to work things out in ways that are fair, effective, and sustainable. But let me note also that there are all sorts of external factors that affect how well a commons can perform. Government, corporations, politics, public policy, all of these uh, are influential, and I'll talk about them more in a later video.